Every creature, and you know this from high school, is made from a recipe that comes from its DNA, spelled out in chemicals A's and C's and T's and G's inside the famous double helix. Every creature has its own DNA, different for mice and then for whales and for flowers, but to go from a chemical recipe, A's, G's and T's, to a real creature that squeaks or soars through the air or turns gloriously pink, that requires RNA. RNA is the thing that turns you from a chemical code to a real, pulsing, living creature. RNA builds life. That's big. So big that to RNA researchers like Greg Hannon, RNA is more important than DNA. DNA really works for RNA, and proteins really work for <laughs> RNA. Would you get an argument, by the way, from somebody else? Oh, undoubtedly, sure. <laughs> So how do you get from DNA to become a real creature? Well, let's take one of those fantastic voyages and we'll show you. We're gonna find DNA and well, we'll make it a typical cell. So we're gonna have to fly in and then go off to the nucleus of the cell, which will make a beautiful castle, the headquarters. And there's the DNA, the master code inside the nucleus. DNA, says Greg, never leaves the nucleus. You ever meet one of those mean librarians, you know, the yes. special reserve section? The ones that go, pow! Right, you yeah. can take the thing, you can copy it, but you can't take the book, because somebody else might need it. So if DNA is locked in the nucleus, how do we get the information out to build our creature? Well, that's what RNA does. That scribe, copying recipes out of the cookbook and throwing them out the window, out to the cytoplasm C that makes up most of the cell, all those recipes floating through the air, they are RNA. And to finish up in that sea, you see hundreds of thousands as well. We've made them into little guys with chef hats. Those would be ribosomes. And in your world, there are chefs who are using the recipes that, that are written in the RNA. And whenever a recipe lands on a chef, whatever it is, he cooks it. Whatever it is, he cooks it. And each recipe is for a protein. Proteins build cells, bone cells, brain cells, all cells. So all these chefs are basically building you. You are made of proteins. And because of RNA, we can copy, we can distribute, and we can cook up you and me. And RNA's been doing this for more than three billion years. But there was something spectacular about RNA that nobody knew till just a few years ago. And they learned about it, as we told you, by accident. Here's a good one. Maybe this. In 1986, geneticist Rich Jorgensen was working at a biotech startup company in California. He was asked to create a spectacularly dazzling flower. That looks good. To attract investors. So that we could convince venture capitalists, investors, to give us more of the green stuff, more money. Still, back in 1986, geneticists didn't know how to work that easily with, say, roses. And so... We began with a simple plant, regular garden variety petunias. Petunias being a plant that were easy to introduce genes to in 1986. And so they decided to create a very, very, very purple petunia. Rich knew which gene produced purple. He knew how to sneak an extra copy of that gene into the plant's DNA, the master text, to be copied by that monk-like scribe. It will be transcribed by the monk the same as any other gene. And he'll throw the transcript out the window into the cytoplasm where the chef will be able to pick it up and use it. Rich thought that if he added more purple recipes, he'd get a purpler petunia. So he did it, and he waited. And what happened? We produced instead white flowers. White flowers? Complete opposite of what we had expected. Completely white flowers. We lost pigmentation completely. Our initial reaction was that something must have been wrong with the gene that we had engineered to introduce to the plant. A mistake? A mistake. So we checked everything out, and there were no mistakes that we could find. So why didn't the petunias turn purple? What happened? The petunia was a big puzzle. Nobody understood why, when you add an extra gene for purple, you should not get more purple, but less purple. It took a decade of brilliant scientists working on petunias and fruit flies and worms and other organisms to finally work out what was going on. And what was going on is, quite by accident, Rich had discovered a secret inside living cells. Cells from time immemorial have had a mortal enemy called the virus. 
So let's imagine that the virus is a pirate ship. It lands. It then sends invaders inside the cell to shower recipes down to those cooks. But some of those recipes, you'll notice, look a little different. And what's in these recipes is not good for the cell. No, it's decidedly not good for the cell because the sole purpose of that virus is to make additional copies of itself and to the point that the entire cell is filled up with this and the cell explodes, releasing these viruses to go and then infect whatever other cells they can find. So the theory is that long ago, cells developed a secret defense system which we will call the COP. What the COP does is when viruses invade and create showers of murderous recipes, the COP looks and thinks, hmm, some of these have a very fishy shape. It's a chemical difference which comes down to some of the viral recipes are two pages instead of one, and one side is a mirror image of the other. But the point is, to the COP, there's something not right about this shape. So when they see it in that shape... They say, virus. They, they go, say, uh-oh. Uh -oh. And the cop <laughs> destroys the recipe. And when you say it destroys, is this... A, should we think like a kung fu kind of thing? Is it like, hi, <laughs> sort of deal? Yeah, a little enzymatically, a little thermodynamics. Uh, enzymatically? Like that. Enzymatic kung fu, maybe, yeah. <laughs> The cop destroys not only the oddly shaped version, whenever he sees that recipe. Oddly shaped, regular shape, that recipe in any form must be destroyed to defeat the virus. And the interesting thing is, until 1998, nobody knew that cells had this defense mechanism. We had no idea it was there. That's what's so amazing, is this whole mechanism had been sitting there where cells were able to tell that something was very funny when they saw mirror image messages and start not just destroying the messages, but destroying anything that looked like that message. They'd worked out this whole defense system against, against viral RNA, and we then accidentally stumbled into using it. The accident was Rich Jorgensen's purple petunia. The question, remember, was when Rich tried to make his petunia more purple, why did it turn white? Well, the answer, it turns out, was that Rich, by accident, discovered the cop. When Rich invaded the petunia cell and inserted his make more purple instructions, he didn't know it, but his purple instructions happened to have that suspicious viral shape. So when the cop saw the recipe, the cop thought, virus, and destroyed every recipe for purple in the cell. So there's no possibility anymore of producing the purple pigment because the purple transcripts are gone. If there are no recipes for purple, the chefs don't cook purple. And because there's no purple pigment produced, the flowers will be white. And that's how Rich and his petunias helped discover what we now call RNAi. RNAi means RNA interference because the cop is interfering with RNA messages with the recipes in the cell. And when scientists realized that every plant and animal cell has RNAi, a way to turn off the recipes, turn off genes, they thought, hmm, maybe we can use these cops to work for us. Okay, Cheber. Yep. Which brings us to Marty Russell, 78 years old. She and her husband used to spend lots of time here at their daughter's nursery. Thank you, Rosie. Years ago, she enjoyed doing lots of things. Her passion was reading. Oh. Uh, she would read everything. Golf. Yeah. I love to play golf, bridge. But then Marty began losing her sight. Couldn't see, and I'd probably get the peppers in with the zucchinis, and there'll be big problems then. So she went to her doctor, who told her... You have macular degeneration. A degenerative disease caused by too many blood vessels growing in the eye, underneath the retina. As these blood vessels grow, they leak out fluid and blood in a center of her vision, and it's, it's as if you're looking through a very dirty windshield, essentially. I went home, I was just devastated. So Marty volunteered to be a candidate for RNAi therapy, something so new she's kind of a pioneer. She was probably one of the first to get it for any disease whatsoever, uh, and specifically for macular degeneration. Hey, how are you? How are you? Good to see you. This one, this is the VIP room. 
I feel very honored. The reason Marty has so many blood vessels growing in her eye, clouding her vision, is there's probably a mistake in her DNA, in a gene that produces too many recipes that say, make more blood vessels. So the chefs cook up proteins for more, and she ends up with too many blood vessels. Her doctor wants her to have fewer blood vessels, but how do you get the chefs to make fewer blood vessels? It's pretty easy. You want to shut down a gene? Put in a copy of the gene with its mirror image. Signals the cell, better shut this thing down. We inserted the needle after numbing her up. So the doctors put literally injected RNA recipes into Marty's eyes that said make more blood vessels. But they made those recipes look dangerous, like viral recipes, hoping the cop in Marty's cells would leap to it and destroy lots of recipes for more blood vessels, leaving Marty with fewer blood vessels. They wanted the cop to turn off Marty's disease. Did it work? Marty's vision has improved. It's a very promising result. I can play bridge now. <laughs> Which is very important. I'm not great, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's part of my life. She can see flowers again. Oh, some of them are just gorgeous. So apparently they did trick the cop in Marty's cells to reduce vein production, although not completely. I see the yellow. Inside is just a little cloudy, but I can see it. There's a lot of questions still that need to be answered. This is not a treatment that is as proven. Can we deliver recipes to the right cells? Lovely. Does the treatment last? That's beautiful. All these are big questions. Still, in mice, RNAi has been effective with Huntington's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, hepatitis, breast cancer. So says Greg, if we ever work this out in humans, any sort of disease that you can imagine becomes fair game. All the diseases which would be helped if you shut off a gene. Cancer, HIV, for example. Wait, are you, is this because you're just an RNA buff that you're saying, you've just listed cancer and HIV. These are famous, big, fat diseases. Arthritis. Well, stop listing them and tell me, is this a prejudice <laughs> that you're telling me, or is this true? I mean, these are all candidates for this kind of therapy? Certainly they are. And finally, we have saved the best for last. The true power of RNAi goes even deeper than finding cures to terrible diseases. Because what RNAi does, remember, the cop's job is to turn off information, turn off genes. The big problem of understanding, say, the human genome is you have 20,000 genes. How in the world are you supposed to know what each one does? Well, one very good way to start would be to turn off gene number one and see what went wrong. So you could go through all the genes that make up a human, or for that matter, make up a petunia, and turn off each gene one at a time. If you trick the cop to turn off gene number one, no color. So gene number one is involved in color production. Try gene number two, no petals. Gene number two, involved with petals, and so on. You could make too many leaves, they could curl up, they could be upside down. Almost anything could happen. But getting rid of the gene tells you what the gene does when it's working. That's right. The RNAi discovery is just amazing. Ten years ago, when we were sitting around talking about what would we really need to understand the human genome, we all said we would need some magic way that you could turn off any gene at will, just based on knowing its sequence. And what's happened is this, this discovery by scientists about RNAi has given us exactly that. It turns out that nature already had a way to turn off any gene at will. And now, with RNAi as their key, scientists will have the means to decode every living thing, to identify the genes that allow us to grow, that allow us to move, that give us beauty and color. RNA is a modest little molecule, but what it gives us is the world. <laughs>